Hello and welcome to the Barcast. I'm your host, Nick Barr, coming to you on a lovely Monday fall afternoon. Um, the heat has broken, the breeze is here, school has started. Penelope just has her first day of pre K today. So, um, changes in the air and changes in the Enneagram. We're starting on the seven today, whose passion is lagula or gluttony. <clears throat> so we're going to read the preface. These are a little bit tricky because Naranjo breezes through the passion. And um, so it's not a good introduction to the passion of gluttony, but it's important because all three subtypes are subtypes of gluttony. Um, but yeah, if you're a seven and you're listening to this or seven adjacent, just like fair warning, this one is a pretty, he's, he goes kind of hard on the seven here. So gluttony. Gluttony is the irrepressible need to taste everything the world offers. Tasting without digesting means taking from the world only the most exciting and delightful aspects and easily rejecting anything that hurts or is harmful. The seven avoids the feeling of emptiness by filling their mouth with pleasurable experiences and stimuli thereby cultivating a great skill for staying on the surface. The seven believes they are filling the void with an illusory layer made up of multiple behaviors aimed at displacement and distraction. So this is really uh, already very important. And we say this over and over again with the passions. They rarely take on their most obvious meaning. And it's true with the seven. So sevens can be gluttonous, i.e. overeaters or overdrinkers, you will find that. But that's not the kind of gluttony that's being described here. The kind of gluttony that's being described here is a taste for life, a taste for experience, and wanting to taste or wanting to fill their mouth with experience, but not actually digest it, tasting without digesting. So you can imagine uh, maybe wine tasting or those Dutch, famous Dutch paintings with all the food on the table, just sort of this smorgasbord of different tastes. And why is that important? Because so much of the Enneagram and energetic work in general has to do with the, the digestive tract. And gluttony would suggest overindulging such that there's a feeling of slowness in the belly, a feeling of in, in being encumbered. Uh, and maybe lethargy that follows gluttony. And the seven doesn't have any of that. In fact, it's the opposite. The seven is very fast. The seven is very surface level, as said here, sort of uh, touching on many different things. And so any notion of gluttony will have to be compatible with that understanding as opposed to kind of a sedentary, lethargic kind of mode. So Naranjo continues, the pleasure of seeking stimuli requires constant movement, which prevents the seven from feeling the lack or frustration that the world obviously confronts them with. If something or someone disappears, it is enough to turn towards another pleasurable stimulus. From childhood, the seven develops an intellectual repertoire that allows them to move nimbly around obstacles. This function has been experienced in family relationships where often the seven, in the absence of the father, physically or emotionally, took on the role of alleviating the mother's pain or depression. For males, this has meant a distant or rejecting relationship with the father. For females, it has meant fulfilling a masculine role, setting aside the feminine dimension, whether in terms of erotic or emotional aspects. This supportive function did not translate, as it did for type one, into a rigid assumption of responsibilities but led to a compulsive need to please and be recognized as a skillful harlequin who serves others without giving up their own advantages. Okay, so that's a lot, and I'm not going to dive into the family stuff here. Um, but again, we're talking about this nimble quality as well as this intellectual repertoire. We're in the thinking triad, so they're very fast thinkers. You'll hear planning come up a lot for the, the fixations of the seven. Um, so there's this intellectual um, nimbleness that 
what purpose does it serve? According to Naranjo, it serves a compulsive need to not just please, but to be recognized while also enjoying oneself, not giving up their own advantages. So the harlequin and fraudulence comes up a lot with the seven because the seven sort of is this um, not just nimble intellectually, but nimble between viewpoints. Not like the nine who genuinely can step into and see the perspectives of other types, but the seven can, in a more fraudulent way, agree with multiple conflicting viewpoints and then evade being caught in that. So there is this sort of playful, um, pleasing quality that ultimately is derived from um, what? It, it, certainly a need to avoid pain. And the seven is sort of, uh, the seven's viewpoint is sort of the most classic human instinct, which is to seek pleasure, avoid pain. But is it that simple? Uh, and I think that that's something that, um, well, let's read the rest of this and de determine for ourselves, like what's behind gluttony for the seven. Although touched by feelings of guilt, they try to escape by distracting the others and their own attention from the wrongdoings. The weapons they use to charm and obtain forgiveness and approval are cunning and seduc seduction. Self-indulgence is their fixation. They take pleasure in their achievements, confusing cunning with intelligence. Making others fall into their traps gives them a narcissistic valuation of themselves. They're not interested in knowing the real feelings of others. Their constant search is for the feeling of satisfaction from their own abilities. For the seven, maintaining a relationship, whether sentimental or social, means adopting strategies. In love, friendship, or profession, they always have a plan B ready to resolve both emotional suffering and the weight of a commitment. For a seven, taking on a commitment means finding themselves once again immersed in that subtle obligation to satisfy the impossible expectations of the family environment and also to stop. The greatest fear of a seven is being unable to escape or not having an exit. So that's the seven. Um, I'm just fixing, also to stop, it's referring to the expectations. Satisfy the impossible expectations or stop them. So there's a lot of family drama here in the explanation of the seven. And I wonder if we can abstract away from that a little bit. The greatest fear of a seven is being unable to escape. So we're in the thinking triad. We were just talking about the six who's at the core of the thinking triad, whose passion is fear. And it's fear in the face of a total loss of relationship with authority. Again, the absence of the father figure, if we wanted to bring back in family. But you you don't need, you could talk about, uh, um, you know, the father figure in terms of church or in terms of country or in terms of external authority, as well as internal family authority. So the seven is still very much in that mix, but rather than um, be consumed by fear and turn that into their passion as the six does, the seven simply uh, flees. They just flee from their fear. And so they seek out pleasure and they avoid pain. So what then becomes their passion is the fleeing, is the gluttony, i.e. the seeking out pleasure, seeking out the positive, and then also not staying with it long enough for it to become real, substantive, rich. It's just on to the next thing, on to the next thing. In part because the seven deep down knows that if they were to stay in any relationship or to stay with anything for too long, it would uh, their fate would catch up with them. And they would either be... Um, annihilated by 
what's described here as impossible expectations or annihilated by sort of the backlog of their unfelt feelings. And um, the seven is not, you know, the seven is feeling repressed. So uh, they're thinking and doing and doing and thinking. And the, the, the reason gluttony is a passion is because they'll never be filled, right? No amount of tasting is going to um, fill uh, um, the, the whole that is speaking, you know, all, all the types have their whole, but speaking of the seven in particular, they've uh, they've kind of chosen to to sort of uh, ignore what Suzanne Stabile would say, maybe ignore sort of the negative half or the darker half of experience. They're really always fleeing to the positive. And um, so the ways that that breaks down is one is life has negative moments in it and the seven may face crisis in those negative moments. Um, and then the other way is that uh, the seven can never really experience anything fully until they learn to um, be with, you know, the whole picture, the positive and the negative. Anything else to say about the seven, at, you know, at this initial stage? Um, It is interesting where th there's a part of what we're describing feels really selfish in a, in a normal way, right? Like there's, the seven is out for themselves to avoid pain and seek pleasure because pain is painful. And a lot of sevens like won't really necessarily see the problem here, right? Like look on the bright side, right? Like, yeah, it does, seems like a pretty good lifestyle to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And um, that, that's not like, that's not wrong. The seven, I think, is one of the most sort of pro-social types in the sense that their passion is really well-suited to thriving in society, to making friendships, to succeeding in the world, et cetera. So again, sort of like uh, this work isn't going to be for every seven and many sevens might be quite content with their passion. But it's not just... Apparently, according to Naranjo, it's not just selfishness that's driving this. It's also, and again, he's grounding it in the family dynamic. It's also about essentially cheering up the mother. This Harlequin who's, uh, look at me, I can do this, I can do that, I can do this, I can do that. This intellectual agility and nimbleness. And I do, in my relationships with sevens, I do think a lot of sevens have that other orientation as well so they don't they don't simply just want to avoid pain for themselves although that's a big part of it they also are sort of on an endless mission to extract let's say their mother or some very demanding internal figure from the depths and so whether it's literally a depressed mother or like an internal stakeholder who is always in a depression. I do think that the seven, we, we need to remember that the seven is, come on, cheer up. There's someone inside that they're sort of always trying to pull out of that. And, you know, whether you want to call that their mother or their inner mother or just their shadow of themselves, I, I don't think we need to be prescriptive there. But there's this, as uh, Ron Ho concludes, there's this, um, th their fear of taking on commitment is finding themselves once again immersed in that project to extract some deeply depressed stakeholder out of their depression. And they know how impossible that is. So they'd rather not do it. They'd rather 
come on, you want to do this? You want to do that? They don't want to be with that darkness that is somewhere inside of them. So therefore, this fear of imprisonment, quite aside from pain, this fear of entrapment, of being drowned, of being weighed down, of possibilities shutting out, that I think is very alive for a seven. Okay, so we'll pause there and then we'll jump right into the social seven. <laughs> 